In the 1970s, a strange visitor walked across a remote pass in the far north of India. Young Englishwoman Diane Perry ventured into the snow-laden peaks of the Himalayan mountains. What was it she was looking for? I believed from a very early age that we were inherently perfect and that we had to come back again and again to realize and attain to our innate perfection. So therefore, my two big questions were, what is perfection and how do we attain it? And I asked many people, teachers and priests and, and everybody who I thought might know, they all say, you have to be good or you have to be good, you have to be kind. And I felt, well, yeah, of course you have to be good and kind, but that's not it. Because, I mean, many people I know are good and kind, but they're not perfect. Perfection is beyond that. That's just the foundation. Diane Perry's search for perfection led her to Tibetan Buddhism. Taking on the name of Tenzin Palmo, she isolated herself in a cave 14,000 feet above sea level. Here, with only the company of wolves and snow leopards, she embarked on a 12-year period of intensive Buddhist meditation. For eight months of the year, during the harsh winters, the cave was entirely cut off from the rest of the world. The whole point of being in these long retreats is that it gives time to really merge with the practice. And also it has to do with this whole idea of identity of the roles which we normally play. I mean, if one is um, relating with others, then one is relating within a role, even if it's male or female or, you know, one's profession, mother, daughter, husband, wife, doctors, lawyers, laborers, whatever. Uh, we all have certain roles which we're playing for others and, and to a certain extent to ourselves. And when one is um, in solitude, especially when one is looking inside, uh, then it gives a chance for all these various uh, identifications to be peeled away because uh, why bother to play roles to oneself? And it, it gives a chance, the space, uh, for, for more deep layers of the consciousness to start arising and be identified. Tenzin Palmo is now one of the most learned and influential Tibetan Buddhist nuns in the world. It has been a long and difficult journey for the girl from Bethnal Green. I was born in 1943 during the Second World War in Hertfordshire, but brought up in Bethnal Green in East London. And my father was a fishmonger, and I have an older brother who was six years older than myself. My father died when I was two years old, and so then my mother took over the fish shop and uh, struggled to bring up my brother and myself. I think I was really quite a typical sort of English girl. I always felt it was a pity. I mean, in a way, being a kind of Church of England, Anglo-Saxon in the middle of London in those days was the same as being sort of nothing. And I envied uh, my Jewish friends who had a, a strong sense of identity and uh, cultural identity, which um, I think, you know, the average person, at least brought up in London, didn't have. I didn't feel a very deep connection with Jesus. I didn't believe Jesus could save us. Save us from what? Only we can save ourselves. God is inside. It's not something out sitting in the sky pulling the strings. And you have to rediscover your own inner, you know, spark of the divine. So during my adolescence, I was looking into many religions, trying to find a very clear definition and path for regaining our true nature. When I was uh, 18, I read a book on, on Buddhism and immediately recognized that 
this is what I had always believed, although I hadn't realized that there actually was a religion which put it so nicely and so clearly. I mean, far better than I had ever formulated it for myself. And then gradually I became interested in Tibetan Buddhism, and so when I was 20, I left for India uh, in order to find a teacher. Tenzin Palmer arrived in India, she was one of many Westerners looking for enlightenment in the East. She went to stay with another Englishwoman, Frida Beatty, at a school for young lamas in Dalhousie, northern India. The school was awaiting the arrival of an important lama, the 8th Kamtra Rinpoche, who Tenzin Palmer hoped would take her on as a student. On the last day of June, which was my 21st birthday, the phone rang and Frida Beatty answered it, and then she said to me, well, your best birthday present has just arrived down at the bus station. Come to Rinpoche, he's here. So then I was just, <gasps> I was completely in a panic, thinking, oh, my llama's come. I had never seen him. I didn't know if he was old or young or fat or thin or anything. I, I had never seen a photo of him. So then I went in and uh, I prostrated and I offered the scarf and then I just sat there and I, I was so nervous that I couldn't even look at him. And so I just sat and I stared down at the end of his robe and his brown shoes. Then I looked up and saw him for the first time. And then it was It was, first of all, as if I was seeing somebody that I knew very well that I hadn't seen for a long time, like, oh, how lovely to see you again. And at the same time, it was as if the very deepest part of my being had suddenly taken material form in, in front of me, that, like he had always been inside me, but now he was manifested outside. And three weeks later, I received my first nun's ordination from him, which was probably not only the greatest birthday present I could have had, but the greatest blessing of my life. said to me that in previous lives I was able to keep you very close to me but this time you have taken female form so it's more difficult. I stayed with him and his community for about six years. I was working as his secretary and also teaching English to the young monks. But because those were very early days, they really didn't know what to teach to a Western person. And also, being female and the only nun, I didn't belong anywhere. I didn't belong in the lay community. I also didn't belong in the monastery. So, although it was wonderful being near to Rinpoche and the other lamas, it was also a time of great loneliness. People ask if I was lonely in the cave, but I wasn't lonely in the cave. I was very lonely when I lived in the community. And also very frustrated because I couldn't really get any solid teachings. <laughs> it was impossible to fight the prejudice within a monastery. Um, there was no way not only because of being Western, but because of being female. I mean, I saw it when male Westerners came, how they were treated, and how much teachings they were given, even if they weren't even Buddhists. 
uh, what to speak of monks if they were just scholars or just anybody that turned up. I mean, the lamas automatically, without even questioning it, gave them all sorts of teaching and so much time and so much attention uh, just because they were males. Eventually, after several years at the monastery, Tenzin Palmer got enough teachings to feel confident she could go into extended retreat. On the advice of her lama, Kamchal Rinpoche, she began to look for a suitable place. Eventually, I heard that there was this sort of cave up on the, on the mountain about an hour or so away from Tayugompa. So one day, a group of us, of monks and nuns, we went up the mountain to have a look. And so then when I saw it, I thought that this would be a very ideal place to, um, to stay. So we built it up and made it a proper wall and put in doors and windows and then mudded it over on the outside and the inside. And then I moved in. This is the very cave where Tanzin Palmo lived for 12 years alone in the retreat. Yeah, here she put a small box, that is meditation box, that is Tibetans called the Gomti. In uh, the Gomti, they, they, you can just sit as a, uh, in a meditation posture, but you cannot lie down. That she did for 12 years, like Buddha did for six years, but she lived for 12 years here in this high mountain cave. So this is the meditation box, and then this was a, um, a box which I used as the table, and then these are Tibetan books wrapped in cloth. And this is the window, and this is the stove pipe. And uh, when one was in retreat, then uh, normally the, the day was uh, divided into four sessions, so you, one got up around uh, three and did the first session until six and then had breakfast and then started again around eight until 11 and then had lunch and then had a break. I mean, there was always things to do, especially in the winter, a lot of um, clearing snow and um, chopping wood and, and other tasks. And then to start again at three uh, for another three hours and then have a tea break and then um, again in the evening. There she, she used to grow some vegetables during winter, summer. And this small area, she grows here turnip, cabbages. That small fence was there to keep the wild animals away. And uh, this is the way where she used to go for fetching water. So we'd come back to Tashijong to see Kamtur Rinpoche to check up with him. When I was away, then I would, if any ideas came to me, I would write questions, all sorts of different kinds of questions, and I would have these pages of questions. And then when I would see him again, he'd sort of lean back and say, OK, where's your list? And I would ask him all these questions. And his answers were always so perfect, because he would say, well, According to this tradition, they say this. According to that tradition, they say that. In this book, it says this or in that. And on this level, it's like this. On this, it's like that. But I think, but this is just my opinion, I think. And it was always exactly right. He was just really, he was a Buddha. Tenzin Palmer's annual visits to her teacher guided her rigorous practice. 
She studied classical Tibetan texts, which described complex visualization techniques. In accordance with the highest aesthetic traditions, she slept for only three hours every night, seated in a meditation posture. Temperatures dropped to below minus 30 degrees. Snow made the cave damp and dangerous. How many months a year did you have snow? Depended on the year. Anything from six to eight months. To eight months. Mm, yeah. Well, Sometimes it would start snowing in November and just carry on until May. Oh, one time there was um, a blizzard mm -hmm. for a week mm -hmm. and, and everything got completely um, <coughs> submerged mm -hmm. by snow. Mm -hmm. And so when you opened the door, which fortunately opened inwards, uh, there was just this like wall of, of ice. It was completely black. God. It was blacker than you can, I mean, there just was no light. And I was afraid that the lamp mm. would be eating up oxygen because oh, I, I thought, well, you know, much the, we're be. completely blocked on all sides mm -hmm. everywhere and that there's, there's only going to be a little oxygen mm -hmm. and that you're going to use it up very quickly. Mm. So mm. I thought, OK, so now I'm going to die. Mm. I mean, because then, you know, when I was getting all, you know, yes, you know, take care of me in the bardo and da 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 and then I heard this voice inside saying, dig out. <laughs> um, I said, oh, yes, right, Rinpoche. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, I love it. So then I, I, I tried digging out. Of course, you know, because it was a wall, mm -hmm. then you had to bring the snow into the mm -hmm. cave, right? Mm -hmm. So indeed, it was not the cave mm -hmm. in the snow, it was the That's snow in the cave. cave. Right. And uh, so at first I, I tried using mm -hmm. a shovel and then after a while a saucepan lid and mm -hmm. then as I was making this tunnel trying to go upwards, uh, I just scrambled with my, my hands mm -hmm. and I had this very cold little dark. But anyway, eventually um, we hit light and got out. And then when I looked out, I stuck my head out, uh, it was still blizzarding. And then I actually tunneled out three times. Mm -hmm before we got to the outside and it wasn't blizzarding anymore. What was uh, the hardest thing you went through? When the police officer came at the end and knocked on the door and said, you've been handing me a notice saying you've been in the country f three years illegally, no, illegally. Mm -hmm. and you better come down because you've got you know, 72 hours to get out of the country. <laughs> Even hermits are subject to bureaucratic red tape, and Tenzin Palma was forced to leave her beloved mountains. She decided to travel to Italy. It was some years before she returned to India. Having planned to spend her life in retreat, Tenzin Palma now questioned what direction she should take. Her own early frustrations as a female practitioner were to influence her choice. When I lived in Lahul, I saw so clearly how, even though many of the younger nuns were so intelligent and bright and devoted, they still had no opportunity for education, no opportunity for study, no opportunity for deeper practices. And this is so throughout all the border regions. Um, while the, the monks are given opportunities for study and practice, this is denied to the nuns who mostly end up just being household servants or servants for the monks. There were so many nuns wandering around who had no nunnery, and uh, especially nuns coming from Tibet, because in Tibet the nuns are in the forefront of the freedom movement, and so they're especially disliked by the communists. And so many of them have tried to come into India. Some of them succeed, some of them don't. Many of them are caught at the various borders and then again gang raped and sent back, handed over back to the Chinese to be put in jail. Many nuns who are here uh, have been imprisoned and interrogated and so forth, so they're very inwardly quite traumatized, but very brave. Oh, 
Nuns who have managed to escape Tibet join the ranks of many other nuns in the border regions who have struggled to access teachings. The lack of opportunities for women led Tenzin Palmer to consider the possibility of starting a nunnery. We went to see an astrologer. And um, so then I said to him, look, I have these two options. Either I can go into retreat or I can start a nunnery. So which should I do? And he looked in the chart and then he said, well, if you go into retreat, very harmonious, very peaceful, very nice. If you start a nunnery, many problems, many conflicts, many difficulties, but both are good, so you decide. So then I thought, well, obviously, back into retreat. Mm -hmm. And then I met with a Catholic priest, and I, I mentioned this to him. And so he said, oh, well, of course, you start in the nunnery. He said, what's the use of always being in a, in a peaceful, pleasant situation? We are like rough pieces of wood. And if we're always stroking ourselves with silk and velvet, that's very nice, but it doesn't make us smooth. To become smooth, what we need is sandpaper. So the nunnery is my sandpaper. Having made her decision, Tenzin Palmer embarked on a grueling international schedule of public talks and lectures in order to raise funds for the nunnery project. A group of sympathetic volunteers stepped in to help with the logistics. We think having big houses and fancy cars and lots of money is security, but that's totally insecure, especially in our present economy. We think having family and relationships and children is security, but that's not security because people leave, people die. If all our ideas of happiness and security are on the outside, then we are like walking on ice. Tenzin Palmer's talks and the story of her remarkable journey to become a Buddhist nun caught the imagination of people all over the world. She became a Buddhist icon and an international celebrity. I think one of the great things about being a nun is you never have to think about your hairdo. You never have to think what you're going to wear. Okay. Uh, I don't have to get up in the morning and, and open the wardrobe and gaze at all my, my costumes and decide what I'm going to wear. I wear whatever it happens to be clean. You don't care what the fashions are. That's right. You know, you don't have to care about anything. You know, what color's in this year or not in this year. It's for you the same old color <laughs> year in, year out. One of the first to recognize the inspirational nature of Tenzin Palmer's story was journalist Vicky McKenzie. Her book, Cave in the Snow, has been translated into nine languages. It quickly cemented the reluctant heroine's fame. I have no glasses, so I'm just <laughs> <laughs> writing blindly and hope uh, it comes out like a signature. <laughs> I'd like to get a t-shirt with a um, quotation from my novel, Tenzin Palmer. Okay. All proceeds goes to Dongyu Gatzeling. I'd like to take a look. We have all sizes. Thank you. You're very, um, you, you give us great inspiration with your courage. Thank you. 
I come seeking wisdom generally and for specific things, and, and it comes through. I get always a gem or two to take home. I, I saw her two years ago and in Sydney, and it's always a gem or two to take home and really uh, transform my life with. And we are noticing that the, the nuns really are really dedicated and practicing, and we hope that in the future some of them, through their studies and through their practices, can also become teachers of others because there is a great dearth of uh, female teachers in the Tibetan tradition. So thank you very much. Taiwan is a very unique situation. There is about three times the amount of nuns than monks. So you would definitely find that uh, there will be more nuns in service in this conference than monks would be. So right over Taiwan. here, we will stress equality between the monks and nuns in regards of activity and work status. Mm -hmm. So you can notice that most of our helpers are all nuns, or all, all women. But mostly delegates are men. Oh, that's so. That of the Chanja Yi is a Oh, that's <laughs> This is basically a, a boys' club with the young girls doing all the work. I mean, the young Chinese girls who are working their guts out for everybody, but the, the big guys are all guys. I wasn't even scheduled to speak. And it's only because they had extra time left over that they probably thought, oh, well, let's stick her in. But, I mean, you know. By rights, my input would have been absolutely nil. In Buddhist tradition, we are told that it's impossible for a female or a woman to attend Buddhahood. Yet we have to transform into a male body to become a Buddha. Yeah, it's strongly emphasized. The Buddha himself was very open-minded, but gradually the Sangha, the community, became more uh, misogynic. So the traditional meditation was to look for a monk or a nun, to go and meditate on the body from the top of the head to the soles of the feet, as if you're taking the skin off and you're looking inside at what were traditionally called the 32 parts of the body. You know, the brains, the lungs, the, the heart, the spleen, the intestines, just seeing it as it is. So as to create this sense of disenchantment towards the body. Some centuries later, the texts by, for example, Nagarjuna or Shantideva, who were great Indian pundits, talk about seeing a female in front of you. And you're peeling the skin away from her and looking at all her bodily parts, or imagining her as a corpse and decomposing and all the worms coming out, etc. Her body is filthy and foul and disgusting. She is an object of contempt. It's no longer the monk. The monk's fine and pure. It's her. And, and so this, this attitude, which is in some of the main texts which all Tibetans study, is very there. <laughs> We can change. The Buddha himself said that we can change. If we could not change, I would not tell you to change. But we can change. We can turn our anger and our, our sense of, of aversion and, and revenge into understanding and loving kindness and compassion. We can do that. Just now you cuddle me, I feel so warm. 
Oh, no, I cannot cry, but now I'm so touching that your love to me. I don't know what you love me in this world, but you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope to see you next time. I don't like giving talks. Otherwise, it would be fine. There's always this little voice inside me saying, what do you think you're doing? And, um, and I think, yeah, what? But there are times when I really feel trapped by the process, so to speak, you know, ending up starting this nunnery and going on world tours and things like that. And there are times when I feel a bit like a, a rabbit in a cage. The years of touring have borne fruit. Tenzin Palmo and her team of volunteers have finally raised enough money to purchase land on which the nunnery will be built. Makeshift accommodation is being used to house the first of many applicants. Twenty-four young girls have already arrived and been ordained. Plans are being made for a nunnery which will eventually house 160. She is, by temperament, a hermit. I mean, not in the sense of being against the world, but the, the way in which she enters the world the most completely is, is a, entering it in grace and in, in um, uh, as a spiritual support, which is tremendous spiritual support to all of her friends and the people who know her. Now, in her expending her time and her energy, on an exterior project. One worries about her. It's as though she's spending on a small specific everything that's great in her. And I see it as a tremendous sacrifice of her. Every moment that she doesn't spend in private meditation is a gift and a sacrifice. One of Tenzin Palmer's ultimate objectives is to introduce ordination for nuns at the highest level. She herself received the full bhikshuni ordination in Hong Kong in 1973. Such high ordination is only available in the Chinese Buddhist tradition. Echoing the experience of women from many faiths, there is continued opposition within Buddhist institutions to the high ordination of women. Tenzin Palmer's determination to change the status quo in the Tibetan system has led her to His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, the spiritual leader of the Tibetan government in exile. <laughs> Mm. 
How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Fine. Maybe. I'm fully recovered now. Oh. Not a problem. May you live to be at least 108, if not 120. Please. <laughs> now, I feel it is very, very important to have one international Sangha sort of conference and discuss the and according to the present circumstances. Of course, the Buddha himself is allowed, or you should give the ordination, the highest ordination for none. Now, uh, therefore, now we must, uh, we must make effort to, uh, reintroduce. to reintroduce yes. into uh, those Buddhist community up to now, no longer sort of mm -hmm. Vishuni traditions. <laughs> this is my sort of, you see, a task which is not yet accomplished. Your Holiness, with all due respect, since I was ordained as a bhikshuni in 73, we are now nearly in 2003. What, what progress have we made? We're still talking about it. You know, Your Holiness, getting anyone to agree to anything. <laughs> you know, there, there's always going to be objections, and it will never happen. We just have to do it. I'm not Banzadara. I'm not Buddha. If I'm Buddha, I'm Banzadara, then I have the final authority you see, to make new sort of traditions. But this is not the case. I know. We are just a sim I always describe myself as a simple Buddhist monk right. who, f who are following it's a Buddhist teaching, and especially according to Nagarjuna's teaching. <laughs> so they, Nagarjuna so, was pretty down on women, I have to say. Of, <laughs> Ah, yes. Uh, and then Shanta there also. <laughs> and honestly, Your Holiness, you are not a female. Uh, you cannot imagine how much uh, one has had this projection onto uh, uh, oneself so and I other think, females. That one is uh, impure, whereas we are immaculate monks, we are not impure. That's true. That's true. That's true. Discourage. Mm. Many occasions. Say I, I made sorry, I, I, I made very clear sort of the argument mm. or suggestions, mm. but even then sometimes it's difficult to change. I know, Buddhists mm. always talk about impermanence and change, but <laughs> like everybody else, they don't like to change at all. No. So the, I think the best thing, uh, I think one of the I think positive, uh, what's the I think way uh, to approach is this uh, what's the problem or issue is, I think, like our, I mean, your work. I think this, uh, eventually, I think, the real effect will come. It so will come. Important. It will come, Your Holiness. It will come. So very good. Just so you remember who we all are. <laughs> and very we good. hope once our nunnery is built, we're mm. building it now, mm. that you will please come and grace oh, us. Certainly, anyway. certainly, certainly. It would be the most wonderful thing for us to happen. Ka, This will go on the front page of our newsletter. It's <laughs> smile. Thank you. This here? Tempan. This, no? Yes. It's office going to be office and uh, yes. office stuff. Yeah, stuff. Um. So this, this here, Mark? This here. Um, and and you, here, you over there. there. Oh. Mm. You're there. This is Yeah. This is cow shed. Oh, oh, and, and, oh. and, yeah, and pump room. <laughs> here, yeah. here yes, and this house. little office just below. And then just beyond that is the study centre. Mm. Going down the hill. To teach her. Yeah? Yeah. In Tibet, Rinpoche, come to Rinpoche, had a nunnery. And within this nunnery, there were also um, uh, groups of these females, the Tokdem Ma, 
they were also very great practitioners by all accounts. Uh, however, as far as we know, after the um, Cultural Revolution, we haven't heard any more about any of them. So I come to Rinpoche um, at one time, placed a kata around my neck and said that he always prayed that I would restore the lineage of Tokdem Ma. I have always felt that as a kind of inner sacred mission. So what we're trying to do is to get uh, some of our nuns at least to the point where they could at least start to be trained in this particular lineage. Tenzin Palmo's Lama always encouraged her to raise the standard of teaching offered to women and to reinstate the Togdenma lineage before the teachings were completely lost. The eighth Kamtral Rinpoche died long before she was to embark on her arduous journey. The building of the nunnery honors a vision they shared. One morning, I was with my Dharma sister, Annie Loder. We went along to the monastery, and meantime, we met another older American monk, another Australian man, and they said, we think you haven't heard. And we said, what? And they said, uh, come to Rinpoche is dead. And I mean, I fainted, you know? I mean, it was the last thing in the world that any of us were expecting. He was only 48. Anyway. Can I say, I mean, I, I felt that I, I was in a, a big desert and, and suddenly my guide had left and I didn't know where to go. But then Annie Loder and I, after a while, we just sat and meditated together and then I, I realized really the lamas are within the heart. And the lama isn't just the outer form. But I must say, I do miss much. In the Buddhist tradition, death is not the end. High Lamas are reborn and recognized as incarnations. Tenzin Palma's teacher is believed to have been reincarnated as the ninth Kamtral Rinpoche. Now a young man, he has continued the support his predecessor offered Tenzin Palma. Mr. Rinpoche, welcome once again. <laughs> As preparations are made to lay the foundations for the nunnery, the ninth Kamtral Rinpoche is present to bless the land. We're having a ceremony for consecrating the land for the first buildings which we're going to be putting up. We'll be doing a puja for the spirits of the earth to ask their cooperation and their blessings on this project. sad reflection that religion and the spiritual path which should be something which opens us all up to our true human potential for wisdom and compassion has often been the very vehicle which acts more to prejudice and to suppression. I personally do not want to create any big waves. That creates opposition. I think it's just very slowly, gradually, things begin to change. The very fact that now nuns actually study and nuns debate is already something which 10 years ago was unthinkable. Hmm. So things are moving. Things are moving, you know, and the thing is to go carefully and slowly and gradually, but just keep going forward. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Please always bless this honor. Mm, well, no, you know, we're the hosts, so we have to run around and talk to people. Secondary. Oh. We have your book, you know, we send it out to the prisoners. Uh huh. <laughs> she said that he said inspire them. Yes, uh, life in the cave, they will feel quiet at home with yeah. this idea. Yeah. Say, Don't feel said, bad, guys. This is where she lived. <laughs> well, she chose it. I suppose as the more I get to know her and spend time with her, and I see how, how she is with people, what she gives to people. Um, how that people who come and listen to her teachings, who come and visit her here, um, how they go away, each of them goes away with something that they need from her. And I think she has these qualities of being able to help people and that she can combine her 37 years as a Tibetan Buddhist nun, um, the most senior nun alive now. There's nobody who's been ordained earlier than her who's still alive. I think only two others were. Um, that her life has, has really crossed a lot of boundaries and, and it's, it's covered a lot of history, if you like, about Buddhism in the West, which I think is also a really fascinating thing about her, that she saw it when, it, you know, when the Tibetan Buddhists came out of Tibet and uh, she was there and she's seen all the changes, she's lived it, she's had the teachings, and yet she can view all of this with a Western perspective. And she inspires many people, women and men, women in particular, I think, who see that she's done it. And therefore, you know, nobody else need be frightened of going for it as well. Living in a cave is very different from living in a house. That's very much a shared experience. There's something very immovable about a cave, which is very stabilizing also for one's mind and practice. Oh, um, this is the thing that I can't How does this compare to your cave? As with my cave, the rock roof is black from smoke and it has mud walls like my cave did. This one here is a little bit smaller because she has a separate kitchen, whereas in mine, the kitchen and the actual room were together. But in many ways, it's very similar. How do you feel when you're sitting here again in a meditation box in a cave? I think the best place in the world to be is sitting in a meditation box in a cave. I couldn't think of a nicer place to be. In a way, people are writing about and recording and relating to this being who doesn't really exist. Nobody believes me. But honestly, I just went to live in the cave because I wanted some peace and quiet and space. I just like being alone. For me to be alone is blissful. People always think, oh, you know, what did you get from being in a cave and all this? But I mean, I think all that is totally irrelevant. It's, it's not like that. It's not like you're, you're studying for a PhD and at the end you get your diploma. You know, and all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions sort of stand there applauding and saying, well done. Old Bodhisattva named so and so. You know, it's not that. Um, I mean, every life, if it's used with any kind of consciousness, is, is a journey of discovery. And um, being in a cave was likewise a journey of discovery. It's not that you're arriving anywhere, but you're journeying. The journey itself is the important thing. The spiritual life is an ongoing process. You breathe in and you breathe out. What I breathed in 
by being in retreat than I breathed out by trying to help to raise the standard for women, the potential for these girls that they can study and practice. And uh, after that, then I need to breathe in again.